So good afternoon again. This is the meeting of the Joint Select Committee on the Jamaica Teaching Council Act, or Bill 2022. The meeting is called to order. We will ask Senator Kavan Gale to just offer a word of prayer. Thank you. Let us pray. Most righteous and heavenly Father, you know why we are here and you know that we cannot do this without you. So we invite your presence this afternoon to guide us through these proceedings to help mold our minds, our thoughts, as we pursue the business of the people. We ask you to guide safely those who are on their way so that they too can also participate. These we ask in your merciful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Right. Well, I have two apologies for absence. Minister Morgan and Minister Green. Are there any other apologies for absence? Okay. So let me say welcome to the second meeting of the Joint Select Committee on the Jamaica Teaching Council Bill 2022. This afternoon, we have presentations, or we will take presentations from the, Jamaica, from the Teachers College of Jamaica. And representing the Teachers College of Jamaica is Mr. Garth Anderson, Dean, Mr. Howard Isaac, Ms. Terry Ann Frith, and, sorry, Mrs. Terry Ann Frith, and Mrs. Jolie, Jolette Russell. We also will take a presentation from the School of Education at the University of the West Indies, Mona. Representatives are Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, Dean, Faculty of Humanities and Education, Dr. Marcia Rainford, Director, School of Education. Dr. Carol Hordat Gentles, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Humanities and Education. And then our third submission will come from the Ecumenical Education Committee and the Jamaica Council of Churches, represented by Mrs. Ursula Khan, member of the EEC, most Reverend Howard Gregory, Archbishop of the West Indies and Bishop of the Diocese of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. And we have Reverend, the Right Reverend Gary Harriot, moderator of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. So if there's, I'm sorry. Please go ahead, member. Well, we would have gotten the written submission from all three from all three entities, and right now we should have read those. Okay. All right. Thank you for the concern. 
Uh, we'll move now to the confirmation of minutes of the meeting held on February 15, 2022. So moved. On here. a point of order, Madam Chair. Just to say that the member raised some issues. Um, you have just, <laughs> we have just, we're just moving on. Okay, well, we have three submissions this afternoon. The submissions were uh, sent to us in writing. We have between now and five o'clock, which suggests to me that we have a full three hours, maybe two and a half to go through this. We will be brisk, we will be quick, we'll ask pointed questions, we will not um, wander off into other areas, we'll just remain focused on this to carry through these three submissions this afternoon. I am hearing you suggesting, Madam Chair, that you believe that the fact that we have three submissions only to make that we'll be able to manage it. I, I just believe that we, it's, oh, it's good to acknowledge the concerns of members and uh, not to make it seem as if okay, you know, the you're concerns, just passing The by. concerns were acknowledged. All right, um, confirmation of the minutes. Uh, so, so move, Chair. Tova. Seconded. Thank you. All right. We will move right into the presentations, and unless there is, there is objection in terms of the order in which I called the, uh, the presentations, we will go first to the Teachers College of Jamaica, next to the School of Education, and then to the Ecumenical Education Committee. So if you'll please introduce yourselves and begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee and those on this side who will be making submission. It's a pleasure to represent the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica, which constitutes eight teacher training institution, public institution, providing teacher education for the system. We graduate approximately a thousand teachers each year, and so we have a vested interest in this bill. The team today, myself, Garth Anderson, Dean of the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica, our legal counsels, Ms. Julian Mowat, and we have a lecturer from the GC Foster College, Jolette Russell, primarily because that's a special college that has special needs. And of course, Mr. Howard Isaacs, he's from a multidisciplinary institution that is involved in the training of teachers. Uh, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, just before I hand over to um, Ms. Mower to present, to start out by saying that the teacher training institutions, TCJ, is not opposed to the bill. Certainly, when we read the ideals, what is it is intended to do in professionalizing the profession, in ensuring that we have standards that will guide the profession, and in a sense to put us in line with other established profession. The debate has been around for a time now whether or not teaching is, in fact, a profession. And those of us who practice that trade, um, without fear of contradiction, will tell you that it is. But we really have some gaps that we need to fill in. Notwithstanding, Jamaica would be the first country in the region that would be, um, well, certainly reach thus far in the process of establishing a teaching council. I happen to participate in discussions at CARICOM, and there is, in fact, a draft framework surrounding the establishment of teaching councils in the region. Part of the challenge with it is that we question where, why is it the government would have an interest in, in fact, such a deliberate interest in monitoring what happens in the teaching profession, 
but that is not the same case for lawyers, for doctors, for nurses. They are independent bodies, and so we are concerned. That is certainly one of our um, concerns, serious concerns. Why is it teachers would not be given their own opportunity to monitor their profession and to set their own standards and to make judgment, professional judgment on their colleagues as happened with other um, entities. The power of the minister, if we talk about independence, is something of concern to us. Um, in the bill, the excessive, and the, our legal counsel will go through that, the excessive penalty um, if you are found to be practicing without, and I wonder if they if it is a way of criminalizing the teaching profession or really professionalizing the teaching profession. The composition of the council itself is still of concern. Clearly, there is no way a teacher could make his or her way down to the hospital and pretend to be a doctor or a nurse, or could go to the nursing council to make a professional judgment on a nurse. But we see all kinds of persons possibly may even outnumber the teachers who sit on the council to make a professional judgment. So we have some concerns cons uh, around that particular matter, the composition and certainly funding. Is this bill going to rest on the um, funding simply coming from teachers? And already we can have a successful debate that we are not paid properly for the job that we do? Uh, is this an extra burden on teachers? And so the role as well of the council itself vis-a-vis -vis the role of school boards. It's not clear what activities will be addressed by school boards as opposed to the council itself. When you read the bill, it seems to me you could have dual investigations going on at any time. If we make a report to the board, somebody could report to the council, and they are all investigating at the same time. So we have some serious concern. Finally, teacher training institutions are, teacher educators are not the same as teachers, certainly in practice. And whether or not the same standards for teachers will be the same standards for teacher educators. There's no distinction in the bill where that is concerned. And if you have different standards, it means that it is going to be certainly different operations and processes will have to take place. So at this point, I'll invite our council just to quickly go through some of, to expound on some of these areas and we take it from there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, could I have some assistance with the PowerPoint presentation, please? Um, one was. I believe there is a revised version that we'll be using. Go ahead. All right, we're circulating a revised, the revised version.
Please go ahead. Could we move to the next slides, please? Yes, the introductions were done um, as to the composition of the council. Teachers' colleges, sorry. So we could proceed. This, yes, as an overview, We'll be raising some, some concerns, um, concern, um, as it's stated there, definitions and uh, functions of the council as they're stated in the draft legislation that we're considering today and regulations and the like. So we could move to the next slide. Starting with the definitions, our first submission of note is the addition of the definition of authorized teacher. Um, the bill as it stands now doesn't include such a definition and we notice that parts of the registration mandate is that persons will be issued licenses as well as authorization to teach but there is no clear definition of who an authorized teacher is. We thought it important as a recommendation to import or incorporate the definition of authorized teacher as presently exists in the education Act and regulations. And those are referenced on the slide, and they're also um, clearly stated in our written submission. So that is our first real um, substantive recommendation, really, that and the defined term be in included in the legislation as it is omitted. The second defined term, which Before we. Before you move on, just a question. Sorry. Um, when I read this, I wasn't quite sure exactly what you mean. Um, if somebody's refused registration as a teacher, you're saying they should still be considered an, considered an authorized teacher? I'm, I'm sorry, I was a bit distracted. Could you please repeat? I'm just trying to make sure that I understand what you, your definition of authorized teacher. Are you saying that someone who is refused registration as a teacher should be um, called an authorized teacher? Yes, that is the definition that no is prescribed in the Education Act. And uh, we know that there is some correlation here because under this new legislation that is being proposed, life authorizations to teach will be issued to persons who do not meet the qualifications to the, the, um, the bachelor's degree quality definition as to what is a, um, a teacher. So while the legislation as it is, is now mentions authorization to teach and by extension of that authorized teacher, there is no clear definition. So we just thought it useful that the definition that now exists in the Education Act be important for, into this legislation for ease of reference. Because Chairman, it does speak to authorized persons being authorized to teach. Chairman, may I ask a question? Please go ahead. Just to, to follow you, Ms. Mott, you are saying that the persons, I'm trying to see who you are capturing. Is it the person, there are those who are going to be licensed and registered as teachers, and there is a third category of persons who will be teaching but they don't have a license and they don't have a, or they are not registered. They'll be authorized under the legislation, yes. And what sort of But the act as it stands, the draft now doesn't define who such persons are clearly enough. So, yes. so at the very beginning, we thought it would be useful if the definition does exist now in the Legis Education Act be imported because it would really help to clarify. And and I'm asking you, Ms. Mowat, the, the type of persons that you think would fall under this, who will be teaching, they're neither licensed or registered. Who 
which category of persons would fall under this? Well, th sorry, well thank you. I say th before, before you respond, sorry, member, um, but I think I was out of order in, <laughs> in intervening in your presentation. And going forward, we'll just allow all the groups first to make their full presentation, and then we'll ask questions. All right, members? Thank you. Yeah. And each group has 20 minutes in which to make their presentation. Just, yes, I'm sorry, I, I should not have started out this way. We just want them to make their presentation. Just make a note of what it is that you want to ask and at the end of the presentation we can do so. For completeness, may I just answer the question that was posed? Please go ahead. Thank you. So, um, thank you, member. The rationale that we have stated as to the persons who will be captured here are those persons who, for instance, are foreign trained, pre-trained teachers, which the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica has a great interest in. Because pre-trained teachers would not, at the time when they're going into teaching practice, have acquired the, the sufficient qualifications to be registered as a teacher, then naturally the law presumes that they will be given a letter of, letter of authorization and so that is definitely one group that will be captured. We could also think of persons on exchange programs or even volunteers. So that is a category that we're thinking of. And I will move on. The next, the next, um, where's the clicker? <laughs> next slide, please. Um, could you go back one step, please? Thank you. Then we want, we're seeking or suggesting that the definition that is stated for teacher be amended presently, which we're just discussing, the def definition for who is a teacher, that person must have certain qu educational qualifications. And two categories are stated in the legislation as is drafted now. The holder must either have a bachelor's degree in education or equivalent, or alternatively, a first degree with, along with a postgraduate diploma in education. We're suggesting that an insertion be made to, the, to add the, follow, the following words, or requisite vocational training equivalents, be it in one, the bachelor's degree area, or in two, which has previously stated bachelor's degree and diploma, to a suitable level of specialization. And this is necessary because we realize, and this was clearly brought out in the Patterson report, that there's a great need for voc vocationally trained teachers within the education system. And uh, if we think uh, the clear reference was made in that report to, for instance, early childhood education practitioners, both, both here and in the UK, where they work side by side, tertiary level trained teachers as well as vocationally trained teachers. So if this amendment is not accepted, we might have some difficulty going forward. There is the mention as it stands now of equivalent education, but that still is in reference to, as we understand it, to having an equivalent to a bachelor's degree, which would not necessarily capture someone who, say for instance, is up teaching plumbing or text clothing and textile at a school. Those vocational trained persons might not have access to education at the tertiary level that might not even be available in Jamaica, for instance. And so to be more all-encompassing, we suggest highly that additional words be added to include vocationally trained persons. And uh, next slide, please. Moving on to the functions of the council. Um, this is section... We're suggesting here that amendment be made at section 7.1 E3 to remove a particular function that is stated there at rubric three. It's the provision reads that subject to the provisions of this act, the functions of the council shall be to, at section E1, determine the categories of one, teachers to be registered, teachers to be licensed, 
And thirdly, persons who are eligible to be granted authorization to teach. Our recommendation is that the function of the council, we believe that the council would not have the capacity and it would not be prudent for the council to beforehand, as is prescribed, prescribed here in the legislation, to determine persons who will be eligible for, uh, in a comprehensive way, list all the categories, all the possible permutations of persons to be authorized to teach. And our understanding is that this particular provision is asking beforehand that the council would make that determination in terms of categorizing these persons. As mentioned earlier, the category of authorization to teach is the catch-all category within legislation, where persons who do not meet the matriculation requirements to be registered or licensed, but they have the skill and competence and can be a value to the education system, will be given an authorization to teach. If a restrictive category is placed or determined by the council beforehand, then the, possibility, the great possibility is that persons who could be of benefit to the community, to the education system, will be excluded. So the recommendation is that section three be removed. Um, next slide, please. We are also recommending that at section 71G, where it states another function of the council that it should regulate the practice of teaching. Um, the Teachers College of Jamaica has a great concern with this provision because as it stands now, the regulation of the practice of teaching would not be, would, it wouldn't seem feasible that one, the council would have the sheer manpower the skill to regulate the practice of teaching throughout the education system at all levels. We also believe that that function is being ably um, fulfilled now by other stakeholders in the education sector. But more importantly, when we look at the mandate of the legislation as stated in the preamble and in section three, which says of the objectives, we do not see whereby this particular power was seems to have been the intention of the parliament. At the time, it seems as if it was just inserted the, um, afterwards. So just to highlight the reference in, in the preamble and in section three, there are only two instances where the mention of regulation is, is stated. And uh, it says the function of the council shall be to regulate the entry and standing of members of the teaching profession and also regulating the professional conduct of teachers to ensure in the public interest that teachers are fit and proper to teach. So the insertion of the in regulation of the practice of teaching is not in the preamble or in the objects of the legislation, which is generally where the mandate is usually stated. So we are a bit concerned about that late insertion and also the fact that it could have great injury to the profession. Uh, moving on, please, to the next slide. Another concern we have under the stated functions of the council is that under section seven, this one, L, three, and M, the council is given the responsibility to monitor and ensure the compliance of registered teachers, licensed teachers, and instructors with the conditions of setting registration, license, and authorization to teach, as the case may be. That's the first point. Secondly, professional, setting professional standards. Thirdly, setting professional appraisals. And at M, it says it should conduct professional appraisals. Our concern and our recommendation um, flowing from that is that provisions ref making reference to the council being able to perform professional appraisals of teachers be removed. We feel that currently that is being, well, as a, it, it's, it's quite unusual. We haven't seen it in other pieces of legislation where a regula regulator is in the position of performing an appraisal function. And that is what we see, we interpret this to be. The, from a clearly, from a 
employer-employee relationship standpoint, the appraisal process is a very intimate one between a worker and his or her supervisor. And we find it very difficult to imagine how that function could be relegated and effectively carried out by a regulator who is far removed from the day-to-day -day teaching process. So for that reason, we feel that it is, it, even if it were to prevail within the, the legislation, we don't see how it would actually function in a very practical way when it is operationalized. So we're not clear what the intent is but or was, but in truth, in practical operations, it just couldn't happen um, in a logical and meaningful way. And as you said, the Patterson Report doesn't see um, the need for that, so we are quite concerned as to the insertion, and we are hoping that it will be removed. Next slide, please. Still on the functions of the council, at 7-1-P, no, this is at 10, right. Provision sections 10-1 and 11-1 speaks to the minister requiring the making the regulations for the, the creation of the professional standards and the continuing professional development framework. So the council will have that responsibility. As it stands now, the draft suggests that this responsibility will be carried out by the council with the approval of the minister. So it would be between council and the minister, meaning the minister of education. We feel that there is great need for greater inclusion in the process, given that um, the creation of and the application of professional standards are really processes that will affect the day-to-day -day operations of teachers, and so more stakeholders should be involved in the process. So our proposal is that words be inserted to the effect of the minister, minister and the council requiring consultation with the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica and representatives of the various educational institutions so that greater input can be had from those who will actually be affected by these professional standards and continue the professional development framework on a daily basis. Um, moving on to next slide, please, on, the, on section 14, the minister is given particular powers, and we find it, as was highlighted earlier, is a particular provision that we think is amiss and would suggest that or highly re recommend that it be removed. All of section 14, our representation is all of section 14 be removed, where it says ministerial directions. The directions, the reason for the recommendation for removal is that the, there is, it, well, <laughs> we would want to prevent any kind of political interference or overreach in the circumstances, especially where we do not see where the, instru the, 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 the draft really seems that the, the instructions would add value to the system. I'll just read um, so we can get an idea of what we're, I'm talking about. At section 14.1, there's three provisions. It says the minister may, after consultation with the chairman of the board, give to the board in writing such directions of a general character as to the policy to be followed by the council in the performance of the functions of the council as appear to the minister to be necessary in the public interest and the board shall, shall give effect to those directions. Um, the, the second clause 14.2 says the minister shall not give a direction to the board that relates to a particular application, which is a license application, to or to proceed in before the council or, or a particular assessment of, an, of a person. So that eliminates directions of a personal nature, if that is at, at all conceivable. And thirdly, it says the council shall give effect to the directions given by the minister under the sections that I've just read. So essentially, our issue with that is we see that there could be great um, 
abuse of these powers, and we would really suggest that it be removed to prevent any kind of temptation. Um, moving on, please. On to registers. This part is not contentious, but is of importance to, to our members, given that it speaks to the kind of information that will be made available to the public on the council's website, and I guess in other, in printed form, if a member of the public wanted particular information, they could access it on a registered person from the council. So what we suggest is that section 22 be amended to, and by virtue of including certain protections, then the categories of information will be excluded from public access. And those, the reason for this really, the concern is that of the need to protect the privacy of the community, of the, teacher, of the teachers and the registrants. And so we feel that what would be left, and again, looking at what happens, what is made available in other professions, really not more, more than your name and registration number should, should be what is sufficient for the public. There is mention, I believe, in legislation about your future employer making a request or giving your future employer access to your website, login, that kind of thing. But in the normal scheme of things, that information will be provided by the prospective teacher who is applying for a job at a school. It doesn't need to be um, available to the general public, which is what you do when you put information on a website. And we have to think of, um, in a broader sense of things, identity theft and uh, data privacy issues. So we would really suggest that the information that is being made available to the public be restricted to what is barely, what is essential, and not go overboard with that. Um, moving on, please, to looking at the section dealing with restrictions on teaching. So sections 24, 25-2, 26-2, and 26-3, all make reference to, well, the institution of penal penalty for penalties and fines for custodial sentences and fines, where, for instance, a teacher is found to be practicing without a license, as in they would have possibly been registered, but the license would have lapsed for whatever reason, and they haven't renewed it, but they're still within the classroom. They're still engaged in the business of teaching. Or where a person is impersonated, found to be impersonating a teacher, so they have not been registered at all, or they're not even qualified. And thirdly, another situation is where a person obtains a license by fraud, or by supplying the council with fraudulent or misleading information. These are where the, the Draft legislation proposes, I think, fines up to as much as $500,000. Um, in looking comparatively at what happens at the, in other jurisdictions that have teacher regulation laws within the Commonwealth, we couldn't find any fines that were so high. And in many instances, criminal penalties did not follow for the breaches that we have before us. And um, I'll give, um, for instance, in uh, Nigeria, which has comparative legislation, uh, breach, right, so Nigeria permits a committee to impose a nominal fine of 5,000 Naira, which is the equivalent to about 10 or 12 US, and or imprisonment up to a maximum of two years for the offense of making false or reckless misstatements of fact for the purpose of procuring a registration or of, of concerning your name or your qualification. So when we look comparatively at the proposed $500,000 fine in Jamaica, that would be equivalent, 500,000 would be equivalent to somewhere over 3,000 US dollars. So for the same offense, we are not, we think that the prescription now before us is excessive. And also when we look at locally other professions that have been monitored, again, fraud, 
and mis mis um, impersonation, that kind of thing, operating without a license, we see where, yes, there is a possibility of a fine being imposed, for instance, in the legal profession. However, that the, the, the point that we would like to bring forward in appealing for the removal of these penalties from this part of legislation is that the, those, the, the kind of breach, the kind of effect it would have for a lawyer who is in a fiduciary relationship with his client, usually large sums are involved if you think of sales transactions and the like. When you look comparatively at what would have the effect on the public of a teacher operating without a license, we really couldn't see that we could say it is that egregious that we warrant imprisonment or a hefty fine as $500,000. And more importantly, what, my <laughs> what the teachers' colleges want me to re reinforce is that given the sums that the salaries of teachers, it is very unlikely that a fine of $500,000 would be able to be preferred. And more, more than likely, teachers would end up being imprisoned for any of these offenses. So we would um, submit that an alternative approach be taken, and the proposal there is that the committee may, as it thinks fit, so when such a breach, such an offense, comes before the committee, using its discretion as it thinks fit, it may give a direction reprimanding the person, as in the offender, or the, the referring the, that the registrar strikes that person from the register officially. So if, for instance, if they were impersonating and they had obtained the, the license by fraud, you strike them off. That is the recommendation on the point of criminalization. Um, next slide, please. Looking at the provisions for qualifying as a teacher, section 28 in particular looks um, at what is necessary to obtain a license and it requires an applicant to be practicing, to have practiced as a teacher in Jamaica for at least three consecutive years of the previous five years. And uh, our recommendation is that that provision be removed because we see that it was particularly eg egregious. We're not sure what is a, ill it is trying to, to address because if it is to suggest that teachers should remain current in, their, in what the affairs of the, the profession, then that is the precise reason why the continual legal education framework is in place. Other professions we know, teachers, nurses, do, I mean doctors, lawyers, they have to ensure that annually they take certain courses. But if you are, for whatever reason, and, and all of us have been affected by COVID-19 last year, last two years, teachers, so many schools have closed. And so if this particular piece of legislation, if legislation were enforced now, what you would find is that when teachers who would have been unemployed for the past two years come to have their license renewed by virtue of the fact that they were unemployed by the pandemic, this would present a bar. And so we really, Force, again, think it should be removed because we are not, if the remedy is that you want to maintain currency within a profession in terms of knowledge, then there's another part of the legislation that addresses that. And uh, we, we can move on. Next slide, please. Right, at section 29.2, which speaks to authorization to teach, we find that the prescriptions there I think it's um, quite a few. Are, it's, we're in, some, need, some kind of remedy needs to be, it needs to be addressed in that our recommendation is that the first three be removed. Our research suggests that the first three requirements usually are presented in legislation where there is a particular need that is being addressed, that is a teacher shortage. The, the, um, the Patterson Report does not suggest that. That is a situation in Jamaica now, and if it wasn't a policy position, we are not sure how or what place it should find in the legislation that is before us. 
And what the hardship it would pose is that many persons would not be given, granted an authorization to teach because at the point in which they're seeking, coming to the council to seek an application, make an application, as it stands now, point 22, 29.2 says that there needs to be, the council needs to be satisfied that one, the prospective employer, meaning the person who is authorized, well, yes, the prospective employer of the person is unable to find a licensed teacher who is suitable to fill the position. And again, if we, we, we think back to what we were saying earlier about the category of persons who we expect to fall in the category of uh, the, this, the authorization to teach rubric, then these would be volunteers, your foreign teachers, your trainee teachers. It would be very difficult for an, a prospective employer to say, well, I have a thousand trainee teachers, but guess what? I, you need to, I can in good conscience certify that there is not a licensed teacher who can fill that position. Because if you have a licensed teacher who is obviously more qualified than a trainee, then you wouldn't really be able to fulfill the requirement in one. Again, as I've said, this is usually in certain legislation when there's a teacher shortage. Point B goes on to say, the council has to be satisfied before granting an authorization to teach that the person meaning the prospective authorized teacher, has the skills and experience appropriate to advance the learning of a, to advance learning of a, of a, teach, of a student or a group of students. Again, we're getting very granular. We're thinking, if, again, if you want to think of teacher, teachers on teaching practice, we couldn't be very true in making this submission, and it would seem to be a bar. More importantly, and more directly to the point, 29.2c speaks to the person who has the skills that are in short supply. Again, we really don't know who would be able to rise to these kind of requirements. And so again, in our view, this might be a bar, well will be, all three combined will see result in a lot of persons being removed from the education system because they will not be able to obtain an authorization to teach because their prospective employer would not be able to say um, truthfully that there isn't a more qualified person, there is a shortage, et cetera, et cetera. So that is our very strong recommendation that those three provisions be reduced, removed because they will cause great hardship, particularly to preaching teachers who will be seeking to get experience before becoming qualified. And in, next slide, please. We are proposing that at section 34A and B, certain amendments be made starting with the provision that says removal of the words charged with or. This is the part that speaks to the requirements. Right, so certain disclosures have to be made when an applicant is making their, 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 their putting forward their applications that the council will consider If the person has, as it stands now, the reading is of 34A says, without limiting subsection one, the council shall make it a condition of registration, a license or authorization to teach that A, if the person is charged with or convicted before a court of competent jurisdiction in Jamaica or elsewhere of an offense of a kind specified in the, in the condition, the person shall within 14 days give written notice of the charge or, sub, or conviction to the council containing the details, details specified in the condition. So our recommendation is that the words charged with be removed so that persons, an applicant would only be required to disclose matters for which he has been or she has been, found, has been found guilty by a court of competent jurisdiction. That is what, um, the, that would be the effect of 34A. And further on in B and C, 
we would we recommend that those provisions be removed. Those put a responsibility on a teacher who has been dismissed from employment to teach um, for professional misconduct or the like, or if the person has resigned from employment following allegations of unprofessional conduct. The provision, as it reads now, says that the person, meaning the applicant, shall within 14 days give written notice of the dismissal or resignation of that person to the council containing the details of the condition. Now, these are circumstances where, as it says, there are allegations, nothing has been proven, and I believe that that particular standard would not be fair, would not be in keeping with due process for those pers for that disclosure to be made where obviously it will have an adverse effect, effect in the outcome of the recommendation or the granting of the license that the council will be making. So that is a requirement to self-report and it goes further at C to say the person is dismissed from employment in response to allegations of improper conduct. That of course is to be defined and or improper conduct relating to a child, the person shall within 14 days give notice of the dismissal or resignation. So you could have resigned in anticipation or frustration. You are to give notice of said resignation to the council within 14 days. So our thinking is that the, well firstly, we don't feel there'll be great compliance with this provision especially the time period, the 14 day requirement that is stated there, I don't think it's very realistic. So to a better option we believe would be to shift that burden of reporting from the applicant, the teacher, well it could be a teacher who is seeking relicensing or a new entrant who is seeking registration for the first time to say that it is now, the, the proposal there is that the amendment should read that the duty, it would be due, the head of the, the education institution where the person, the teacher is employed who has to report proven misconduct by a registered, licensed or authorized teacher. And uh, that we believe would, would, would solve the inherent conflict that the, would, would arise with the requirement to self-report as it, it stands now because the head of the educational institution would be a more objective person and also we would hope that they would have substantive information before passing that on, which is why we recommend that the, it be, be after a report ha, it has been proven that there has been some kind of misconduct that, that would information be forwarded to the council for its consideration because we know that these matters are specifically to be considered as conditions for registration. So um, it can only have one particular impact. Um, moving on please. If there is any delay, still under section 30, if there is any delay in reporting, then we, we recommend that there should be some reinforcement of the fact that the council has a right to continue its investigations, maybe if it gets some information from the media or the police, the fact that the applicant has not self-reported or the head of institution has not made a report or complaint or for the information, the, the council should ensure, should be reminded that it has all encompassing powers in these instances to investigate and follow the necessary disciplinary procedures that we would expect in these circumstances. So we believe that would be an appropriate remedy to section 34A, 34, 30, comma, um, um, in brackets four and five. Moving on to the registration to requirements, yes. This one is, is pretty, pretty straightforward as it stands now. It's, it, it's really asking that persons in early childhood institutions provide who are seeking employment or if you're seeking to be licensed or you're a specialist with an early childhood education institution, then you, one of the documents to be provided to the council for registration and licensing would be a background check, criminal background check. We recognize in the state of affairs in Jamaica now would recommend that the remove the provisions, the, the words in the case of a person who intends to teach in an early childhood education be removed 
and this would become a wholesale prescription so that every applicant to council will be subject to criminal background checks, as in the provision of that kind of reporting at the point of application. Um, moving on to the par part that speaks to um, the provision of fees, this is section 36.2D and 37.2D. These are fees for registration and licensing. The recommendation is that persons who should be subject to the pain of fees are those who are employed by independent schools and non-Jamaicans. And moving on. But it concerns the re renewal of licenses and authorization to teach, and a condition of renewal authorization to teach is something similar to what we, we found earlier, where there was a prescription of being actively engaged in teaching practice for three out of the last five years. So again, we have an issue with this because it would we see, especially for women, um, as you could go and leave for eight months, which happens quite often with teachers, and you, that is compounded with vacation leave, maternity leave, you're out, of, you're, not, you're, you're out of the practice for three years. And again, a hurdle is being presented now based on how this legislation is drafted when you're trying to re-enter the system for whatever reason, it could be illness, whatever reason you decide to take a long break. We don't see it happening or this, a similar provision in any other profession, anywhere in the jurisdiction, well, anywhere, anywhere for that matter, where a bar is presented from practicing your craft. And we take, we find that to be very, very problematic and would recommend that strongly those provisions be removed from the legislation into this draft. Um, a few more slides, next one please. This in section 72.1 speaks of the responsibility to create regulations to follow from the act after it is promulgated. Presently, as it is stated, the resp that responsibility rests solely with the minister and the council, as was stated earlier in a similar provision when it spoke to the creation of guidelines for professional standards and continued, continued development framework. We believe that the stakeholders who will be greatest affected by the implementation should have a, a say in the crafting of the regulations. And so we have recommended that words be be added to the effect that teachers, colleges of Jamaica and representatives of the various education institutions make the regulations for the proper carrying out of the purposes and provisions of this act. Currently, that is solely the remit of the minister and the council. Next slide, please, which speaks to, yes, keep going, thanks. Yes, right there, the transition requirements. So what section 82 is saying, as it is drafted now, every person who immediately before the appointed day was registered with the Education Act as a trained teacher shall be deemed from the appoint, appointed day to be registered under the Act. We are suggesting that this category be broadened to include persons who were actually licensed, authorized to teach at the appointed day because um, otherwise you might have persons being left out who, are, who would have not been, who would have been engaged in the system before. So you just, just make it wider to actually represent what is happening. In the first schedule, where it, comes, where it speaks to the composition of the board, constitution of the board, we have noted, we have some recommendations. The first being that, next slide please. The first being that the, the minister, sorry, the chief, the chief executive officer of the council, we recognize that he or she will hold a seat on the, on the, on the board. And we would just, for, in an attempt to limit the powers of said individual, 
at the words ex officio after. And uh, further, next slide please. The, there is a prescription as it stands now at section 1F under the under schedule one for two representatives of an educational institution that is not a university, um, which education training institution, sorry, which would be, which would cover institutions such as the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. We would suggest that that number be increased to three, recognizing that the Teachers Colleges of, there are other entities engaged in teacher training outside of the membership, which now consists of eight. So we would suggest that, that number, not the numbers that are allotted to the board from educational institutions be increased to three, with allowing for two of those to come from the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. And uh, next slide, please. We also would recommend that the composition of the board be much wider to represent other members, other stakeholders of the education system. We have recommendations there for a member of the medical, med, a medical professional specializing in psychiatry and or developmental psychology, a professional trained in assessing special needs children, an advocate or member of a parent support group for mentally and physically challenged learners, a renowned scientist representing the STEM community, we believe that the poet laureate should be there as well as an artist and a teacher from Edna Manley representing the creative sector. Also, we think student representation, students should be represented in a greater numbers from teachers colleges and, and teacher training institutions, as well as the growing number of parents who are deciding to homeschool their children. We believe that at least one person from one representative from that body should have a say on the council. And my final submission on the last slide speaks to the schedule four, which make, makes mention of the fitness of a teacher to teach. And there are certain prescriptions there, and there's provisions throughout at sections 24, 25, and 29, which speaks to particular tests that could be introduced that the council will take into consideration when it is considering an application or considering the fitness of an applicant to enter the teaching practice. And we would just um, hope that an addition would be made to ensure that persons to take into consideration the newly passed disabilities act so that persons who for whatever reason are physically, mentally, challenge or otherwise challenge will not be excluded, precluded from entering a profession, especially if they were already registered. So you can, for instance, imagine the hundreds of persons, victims of motor vehicle accidents, and motor vehicle accidents we have every year. If you have a teacher who get, becomes disabled by 70% or whatever percentage is confined to a wheelchair, upon presentation of a medical report, confirming that we, we want it to be made very clear that that in itself should not be a bar to that person being registered or licensed. So we really hope that great care should be taken in the consideration of the things that the council is being asked to take in, to, to bear in mind when they are considering the, the conditions and what they consider to be fitness. It's not just physical fitness, there's mental fitness. And when we think of the different kinds of specialized, um, special needs that children have um, within the education system, and oftentimes there's need for representation of those who suffer from those same kinds of conditions or maladies. Um, in other jurisdictions, we have, we notice that there's greater, there's great, there are less restrictions then on persons with disabilities being able to enter the workplace. And we would really strongly urge that this piece of legislation does not go in that vein to, 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 um, to seek to hinder our progress in that regard. And those are my submissions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, members, are there any questions? Any for clarification. Um, 
Yes, Madam Chair, just a question. Um, first of all, thank you, Ms. Mott, for the detailed presentation. Um, you referred to the Nigerian law or regulation, which had us, what year was that drafted? I don't have it at hand. I, the, the intent wasn't to be very prescriptive. We know that the, there is the Office of a Parliamentary Council and the, the Ministry dedicates to legislative drafting. We just wanted to highlight the options that avail in other jurisdictions. Right, so, I, I just asked because if you pull some of our laws in Jamaica, the fines are, not are $5, <laughs> $20. <laughs> But it depends on the year the law was drafted. So it is an important point to make. Mm -hmm. If you're making a comparison, we have to know what year those laws were drafted. Um, if my memory serves me right, and I stand to be corrected, the Nigerian um, regulations for teachers was drafted in the 90s. But I, I stand to be corrected um, by you on that. And the, my second question was, in terms, from what I'm hearing, and I don't want to misunderstand you, so again, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. What this bill is trying to do is to make a major change in Jamaica from what exists now to what will be. And we will be so proud of the Jamaican education system. So it will become, it is a noble profession. And I can say this without fear of contradiction because I taught leaving out of university because my mother said, Jamaican education system has given me so much that I need to give back. So I taught for two years. So this is a profession that I hold dear to my heart. So I taught mathematics for two years. And my mother served her entire career as a teacher and principal. But I say all this to say that I'm, I'm a little bit concerned and you need to guide me here. I'm hearing that the, the, the oversight is too much. I'm hearing that the teachers cannot afford the penalties. But in my mind, there is a solution to not being able to afford the, solu the penalties. Don't break the rules. So I'm wondering what's the thought process? Because if you don't want oversight and you don't want penalties, how are we going to make this the noble profession? And to compare it to lawyers and doctors, and I'm, I don't mean to offend any of my colleagues on this side who are lawyers or doctors, but teaching is a nobler profession that should be held at a higher standard. So because without our teachers, there would be no lawyers and there would be no doctors. And and as such, we have to ensure that the profession is held to the highest of standards. So is it no penalties and no oversight? So how does the profession work? I, I'm just asking for some clarification. How does it work without oversight or penalties? Right. So thank you for those comments, Fembo. We, we, just, we would like to separate um, the provisions, and I would, it would be more helpful if you were to mention the specific provisions you're mentioned, referring to when you say no oversight, because that has not been our presentation. We don't want any oversight from the council. We haven't said that any at all. So if there's a particular provision that you'd like us to address, we'd really like us to point that out. But as to the part about penalties, yes, we agree that, like with every other offensive act within society, one way of not getting caught is just not to commit the offense. But we can't take that approach because if that were the case, or penal, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have prisons, right? And we wouldn't have criminal laws. So we would love to not have prisons. would absolutely love it. Right, but that's not the reality. So we have to, we have to um, address the situation that presents us, specifically in Jamaica. And what we find, yes, you will find, in every profession you will have bad apples, as we say. Mm -hmm. But what we are, see, we, are, we are trying to urge is that we are not excessive in the, yes, we, are, we know if a child in any situation breaches, makes an offense, even a home or in school, there is, a, there is their repercussions. That is how society works, so good order and management. So we're not saying that there should not be any, any, of, any, any kind of punishment. But what we have found is that 
this situation as it is draft, as it's presented before us now, where a teacher could be imprisoned, then uh, it seems to be excessive because what is the remedy? When you look at the kinds of offenses that would tend to attract a, pain, a custodial sentence, we have not, again, as I've said, we haven't found in looking at other jurisdictions, looking specifically at teacher registration legislations, not any other kind of legislation. We're not seeing whereby, one, fines are implemented. Secondly, if they are, they are not excessive. They are not as high as in a Jamaican context. So they should be affordable? Yeah, well, but they should be commensurate with the, the offense. And so, if we're seeing, so you have, when, as, as But if it's not, sorry to but if it's not punitive, what's the purpose? It should be commensurate with the offense. So, for instance, So if, someone pretending to be a teacher when they're not, and sitting in front of my five-year-old child, if I had a five-year-old child, you don't think the fine there should be that harsh? It should be smaller so that they can afford to pay it and do it again because they can afford to pay it? I remember, may, may I just add to the discourse? Because um, I think there are some other issues we are not considering. A teacher cannot be in a classroom and the ministry is unaware. It's a system. So quite frankly, there should be no teacher in a classroom and the ministry is unaware. We are not going on a witch hunt. This is a system. Your system should tell you when my license is coming to an end, should alert you alert the whole system, principal should know you shouldn't be there. This is precisely one of the reasons that teachers have with the bill, why there are pushbacks from teachers. Because it is f felt out there that it is a way to criminalize teachers. And, and, there is, and it's, that's a discussion across the region. We are seeking a way how to punish teachers. When we talk about professionalizing the profession, it's about advancing mentoring, pushing ahead. It's not about all being penal. We can't get people to comply without being penal. It's not a court that we are setting up for teachers. And that's something we need to understand. That is why the majority of our teachers have issues with it. And that's a pushback coming from, I can speak for across the region because of another hat that I wear. So we, we have to understand. If we say we are professionalizing the profession, that has a particular meaning. And we are not saying we don't want oversight, but you check the other professions. They do not have, I mean, the lawyers are not under the Ministry of Justice, as I understand it. They, they monitor themselves. Here we are setting up an entity under the Ministry of Education. With who pays the, minister the lawyers, that though, has, versus who pays the teachers? Uh, well, well, the same thing. Who pay nurses? Do government pay nurses? They have a system not like the one we have. They don't, they are independent. Well, I'm just telling you, they are independent. The nurses govern themselves. And we looked at the act. No. We examined that. Nurses govern themselves. Lawyers govern themselves. That's how it is. They are not under any ministry with powers. As far as we know, the minister in the Ministry of Justice can name somebody to the board, not to take it over. Teachers, we must be careful we don't um, dumb down the profession instead of professionalizing the profession. We are bright enough to be able to monitor ourselves. We don't need ministers to come with certain powers and per to criminalize teachers. Teachers are capable, like every other profession, to monitor themselves. This is so, precisely part of the struggle teachers, the majority of teachers have, because it seems it's a way to create a court to try teachers. And we have to, uh, my urging is that we must be careful we don't give that impression. And look what happens in other professional bodies. Um, I, I think Member Brownberg was ahead of you. Go ahead. Member Brownberg and then. Thank you very much, Chairman. I want to thank you very much for the presentation that um, has been made. I note the broadening um, and inclusiveness in terms of the composition of the council that is being um, suggested. And I want to thank you for making the point 
about whether it is we are in fact criminalizing or professionalizing um, the teaching profession, because I think that it is an important one. So there are a couple of questions that I had. I, I agree with you that uh, certainly here and elsewhere that a number of our professions actually have a code of practice and that there's a body that actually oversees that and not necessarily um, the one that is set up as a council. I wanted, because you did not actually make a suggestion as to how you saw it happening, and so I wanted to ask you what happens in other jurisdictions and how you would see um, that happening in Jamaica if we were to remove from the council the regulation of the practice of teaching itself. So that, that, that's, that's one. Um, uh, yeah, and I think yeah, the same thing goes here yeah, in terms of the, the, the appraisal. Uh, yeah, I think that... I think that is really an overreach of the council to also include appraisal. And I am hoping that before we are done, we would all come to that um, realization. Um, you use the word though in terms of the impact of uh, teachers who might be in the classroom and not registered, or those who, yeah, who are not registered. And you said that their impact is not as egregious. And I want to suggest that sometimes it's more egregious. So, you know, just, just to know that. At the same time, though, I do agree with you. And, and every time we discuss bills and fines, we talk about whether or not they're excessive. And I think that that is the point you are making um, in terms of persons who are in the profession, what they are paid in the profession, and how that relates to fines and especially if you compare that with other professions as well. And I think that that point also is well taken. You made another interesting point, which was uh, the, I think it was in section 82, talking, um, where it spoke about um, who should be considered immediately before the appointed day, that anyone who was in the profession um, in that kind of way, that they should be considered registered under the Education Act. Um, and you suggested that it should be everybody and not just pre-trained teachers who should be um, approached in this way. And whereas I understand where you're going with that, I, I was kind of curious um, to to hear what you think would have been the implications of doing that, um, well, of not doing that rather, what would have been the implications of not doing that, only restricting it to preaching teachers who would be considered appointed on the day, up there, yeah, pre-trained or early childhood, uh, early childhood, um, yeah, early childhood. What you thought would have been the implication of not doing as you suggested? Are we on the transition on provision? Or on section section that 82? That one, yes, for that last one. Yes? So, so, right. So, as it stands now, when this act comes into force, say it is today, then all the teachers, as if we were to apply the legislation as it is drafted and before us, teachers that have been registered as of yesterday, then automatically they would have the same right, the same standing as a registered teacher if the council were, act when the council actually becomes, it comes in effect. We know these things actually take some time. But let's just work with that kind of situation, you know, the clock churning over at midnight. Then, but what we notice is that the, the legislation doesn't make, because currently there are teachers who are um, registered and licensed. And so we, we are saying that if you only bring over those who are already registered, then what about those who are authorized to teach? You know, we just want to be as clear as is possible because we have different categories of persons in the system and we believe that a legislation that is 
has clearly from beginning to end is meant to see, speak to persons who are registered, licensed, and authorized to teach. It's three categories of persons that legislation is seeking to, to regulate, to, to have, to monitor and, see, and ensure compliance within the system. So if at the very end of it, in a transitional provision, then you should really seek to carry over everybody and not just one subset. Um. Sorry, Senator uh, ju ju just want to respond to a point raised by the member Ree, the practice of teaching and evaluation. It is practically impossible. And if you look carefully at the bill, it is another super education ministry. If they should do all that they are undertaking to do. We are talking about 1,000 plus, I beg your pardon, Not at all, not at all. I, I can't comment on that, I remember. That's not my duty to, to comment on that. I, I can only comment on this side, what I'm here to do. The, the fact is, it's a super ministry. There are too many things the council is taking on. We're talking about 1,000 plus schools, public schools now. We don't talk about the private schools in the one plus. Tell me how, where they're going to find persons to monitor the practice of teaching. That, that's just impractical. And when we talk about evaluation, that's a very intimate matter. It's between you and your immediate supervisor. I can't say you stay in, in a ministry and determine that I'm performing or not performing. So that is just too much that they are taken at a far overreach in my view and in our view on this particular matter. That must be left at base, not, it cannot be centralized. And I, in, importantly, while we examine the bill, as I said, it's a super, the cost to set this up, the cost, who will pay financially? Who is going to pay? Who will pay? It's a super, super ministry. Another region, if you ask, who is going to pay? Because you're talking about monitoring approximately 30,000 teachers. That's what we are looking at. Is this practical? Should we be going to what is practical? And how do you use already established mechanisms within the system to treat with this monitoring, it cannot be centralized as is purported in the bill. Okay, um, Member Braham. The, an observation before I ask two or three questions, Chairman. The first one is, I know that references are made to the lawyers, but lawyers who practice unqualified or without certification are subject to criminal penalties. The other question, if I may go to section 36, subsection, well, it's, it's really not section, it's not a bill yet, but 36, 2D, the issue of causing the independent, the teachers of independent schools to pay fees, and maybe foreigners, but nobody else. I would like to know what would be the justification for such a discriminatory practice. I, I, I really would like to know why would you want your colleagues who are in private school to pay fees? Why did you didn't say nobody pay fees, but why them? Why did you single them out? That's the first question. And the next question I want to ask is in relation to the issue of charges. Conviction is one thing and charge is another. But it, is, it has happened where persons have been charged and they are not convicted for whatever reason. Or they are accused of certain misconduct in the school. Let's state that. And the, the management decided for whatever reason that they're not going to go through a process to discipline them. They speak to them quietly and tell them, please leave. And they leave quietly and go about the business. And then they go to another school next week. And nobody knows about what they had done. And so they continue at the other school. 
And if he does it, or she, again, he goes to Montego Bay, and he continues, or she, in that way. I believe that is a, is a proper mischief to try to, to cauterize, because it actually happens. And so I want to know whether you agree that that's a situation that, is a, that to me is problematic, and then I'd also like you to answer, why are you seeking to cause the independent school teachers to pay and nobody else? Thank you for those questions, Mimbo. The, I'll start firstly with the reporting. The, 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 as I see it, what the second point you raise is putting a duty to self-report on an offender or someone who is believed to have com com um, committed some kind of breach. And uh, we're not disputing, as I, as I said earlier, we are very mindful of all the kinds of criminal, quasi-criminal activities that happen on a daily basis within our within the society and the education system which is a subset of the wider society. So yes, we under appreciate fully that these kinds of offenses happen and they should be persons who are actually in violation. It would be very beneficial if you remove them from the education system, especially not have them as teachers. Our, our concern is that as the bill is presented now, the duty to self-report, as it says, is the person who is, was, you know, resigned for whatever reason, or was, was dismissed, that person now must report to council within 14 days that this particular thing happened. And we're just saying, again, being mindful of the culture that we live in, that compliance would be very low in that regard. So if it is that you want to just pass this piece of particular provision and ever the persons who it is meant to capture just don't comply, then fine. If that is a way of getting them out. So when the council actually finds that 14 days passed, they didn't comply. If it is hard and fast and then you're automatically struck off, then maybe that is what should say, what should happen. But as it stands now, we believe persons are just not going to report, especially within 14 days. So there are two issues, the self-reporting and the time within practically you're expected to report as it is drafted now. We believe a better approach to cauterizing situation as you have described it is to say every teacher reports to a supervisor, there's a head of school, there's a head of department, there is a board, there is a principal for every institution that we're, we have in contemplation here. So rather than put the, bo the burden of reporting again on the would-be offender, then let it be somebody who is more objective. And so thereby the offender would not necessarily even know that a report is being made which is what should happen. The principal of an institution or head of department of a school should feel so obligated to want to cleanse and sterilize and maintain the nobility of the profession that they now send in a report to council. That is our submission. So we could get to the, the remedy, but in a more useful way because we don't feel as if persons who you're asking, the would-be offenders, they're not going to self-report. So we would want that, that responsibility to shift to persons who are more responsible and give them that duty, that burden to report to council to say, yes, I have dismissed so-and-so, these were the allegations, they were not founded, so you know, council now should look at it with a certain level of scrutiny because they were not founded, or maybe they attach a report. But we just believe that the, the offender is not going to self-report, especially within 14 days. And as to the other question of fees, it is really addressing, seeking to address the wider question of, of funding, as Dr. Anderson was um, mentioning, has mentioned a few times since we've been here, is we, as any, uh, understand that as any newly established entity, it will, especially given the kinds of responsibilities that has been trusted upon this council, it will need significant funding. So, we, Otherwise, it's not going to be effective. If even in the most basic things, it will not be able to carry out if it's not properly funded. So we're just wondering how we don't want that burden to just all of the revenue to come from fees. 
And if that were the, to be the case, we would be making a very strong case that if then you would find a, an, an emphasis being placed on very high fees, if that is going to be the primary source of funding for the council. And again, our teachers who are concerned, once you say fees, then they could be, there's no latitude as to where we start, where we end. Other professions that are regulated, we know fees go up every year, and really there's nothing you can do about it. After, there, there's nothing. So we would just want us to be mindful of to see how is the council going to be funded. Well, but and why shift the burden to the independent school teachers? That's what I'm interested in, why? Okay, right, so, so, so the thinking there is that they would be better able to pay those fees oh, the the, the, the lawyers. by, by, by the lawyers? let me finish. And also, also just the, and, and I say that to say, if we're, we're to think of other professions whereby public sector workers are, don't have to pay certain fees. Speaking of, for instance, in the, in the legal profession, um, to get a practicing certificate, that, that it is not mandatory that every year public sector workers have to require such a such, make such a payment because it is the thinking is that their employer, their one client, is the government entity that they are engaged with. So we understand that to mean, in simplicity, so that there is a recognition that depending on who your client is, who your employer is, then there is a direct correlation with your ability to pay, and in particular fees. And again, if we could address this, we would really like for the attention to be focused on how the council will be funded. And we just don't want or don't wish, my, my, my clients are very concerned that in years to come, that yes. the, 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 the fees will, the application fees, the licensing fees, even though they're set at every five years, will be at a rate where it is prohibitive. Okay. So this is again where a teacher might not be able to afford a licensing fee, so they fall out of prescription, and then they have to go and pay a $500,000 fine. Okay. But so, I'll end okay, by just, just saying to you that maybe the private schools are not doing as well as you think. Yeah. They provide a good service, but they are struggling, and I, I, I find it really troublesome that you should recommend that the private school bear the costs of the, the system. I really All do. Right. Um, to noted, you, to you member. Madam Chair, just a quick comment. I, I think the premise we are looking at, Member Graham, is that as public sector employees, government pays, for the most part, teachers in the public system. We are of the view that because we are so engaged the government should have some say in us operating within the system. That's our view. It may not necessarily seem logical now, but in the reality, where we sit as in persons engaged in the system, it is challenging. Now, with the private sector, even though they are providing, or the independent schools are very critical service, they are doing it, again, for public good, but also they are doing it for their own development within the private system. And therefore, we are just of the view that if, and, it, and I, I want the membership, to you, Madam Chair, to recognize something. Where the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica are, where, are, where we are concerned, we see the need for the bill. We are not disputing that. But when we review the bill and go through it at length, at depth, from, from every sector within the system, we recognize that there are quite a number of issues that needs to be addressed, and we cannot reach the mountain top one drop. We have to go through processes, and we have to build upon it so that in the long run, it will be as effective as it ought to be. As the bill is presented, we are going to the top of the mountain, and the system, the foundation, is not in place for us to get there. So that's the basic right. point that we are bringing across. Thank you. Thank Very you, important. Member Isaac. Thomas, thank you, Mr. Isaac. So you, your, your legal representative really went through in detail um, all the objections that uh, they have with the bill. Uh, I think Member Cuthbert, you had a question, and then we'll take um, with Member Hamilton. Thank you very much, Ms. Mott and your team. Um, let me say that I am in agreement with uh, 
when you spoke about registration, license, authorization to teach, um, not just to have it require a criminal background check for um, just for early childhood um, institution, but just looking at <laughs> what's happening in our culture that I, I also strongly believe that that should be made for everyone, all schools, not just for early childhood education. I want to ask, however, in regards to eligibility, um, why would you recommend that we remove section 28B2? Uh, one second. Um, yeah, just why should that be a problem? I understand that you mentioned COVID-19, but from what I understood is my child was on online <laughs> learning. Um, and I think quite a number of students were online and teachers should have been in the classroom some kind of a way um, teaching. And I know that for some who had challenges with um, internet connection, um, I think some of those teachers were also teaching um, using the television, um, the broadcast channels and other channels to continue their teaching. So. I am not understanding, I guess I want a little clarification as to why you would want that to be removed, um, requiring that applicants for a license must have practice as teacher in Jamaica for at least three consecutive years. Um, and here it spells out that um, you know teachers ex except in the case of a newly qualified teacher has complied with, et cetera. Um, why would you want that to be removed? Well, firstly, I <laughs> really should be asking, and I did ask, what is the purpose of that particular provision? As I had posited, from my own understanding, if it is as it usually exists in other pieces of legislation trying to reg regulate in other professions, it is to ensure currency. So you have to teach you have to engage in your CLPDs, CLEs, whatever you want to call them annually so that you know what is happening in the space. But that is one thing that's a requirement for obtaining your license. Having granted me a license because I've attended the CLE courses, whatever, whatever, then it doesn't say that I have to teach. If I want to go on vacation then and or go into early retirement, you mentioned COVID-19, I thought you were going to mention the unemployment rate, because that is particularly the, the, the implication that we see per a lot of um, private schools in particular were closed. The, the fact that schools were closed, it means that teachers were unemployed. So they were not, unless they were um, having, doing private classes for which they would have been schools were, there are many schools that were shuttered there are many schools that were shuttered during COVID-19, and as a result, teachers were unemployed. And so that happened, that transpired for two years. It might not be that many persons were that unfortunate, but we're just seeing in circumstances whereby for whatever reason or complicity combination of reasons, a teacher is not interfacing with a, teach, with a student for three years, Again, we don't know how this three-year period was, was introduced, but it is there. It could have said one, it could have said two, but it says three. For whatever period, the teacher is not actively engaged. When he or she now determines, too, that they want to continue to practice, to continue to earn a living by the profession that they would have, would train, would have trained for a long time to acquire these qualifications, then why should the council put a bar to them re-entering the profession? And that is what we, the effect of this provision, because if for whatever reason you want, you, you win the lotto and you want to go on vacation, it really shouldn't be council's business. When I want to re-engage once I am qualified, once I have met all these qualifications, then I should just present these things. But as it stands now, one of the requirements that council wants you to meet is to say, oh, I need a letter from your employer. I want to know that you have been actively engaged in the practice of teaching for the three years. But I have done my CLEs. You know, I have my background check. Um, I have even, could I, I could have used this time to go and study. 
we don't know and we respectively think it is not the ambit of the regulator to say when a person should be engaged once they have met the other um, conditions. We're talking about professional standards. Again, I don't see it happening anywhere else. Um, uh, if member, I just follow up, I, I just think I have some sort of a difficulty with, you know, one thing you mentioned, and p maybe people could use that as an excuse. I want to go on vacation for three years. And, um, you know, who knows, curriculum things may change in the school system. I'm a certified personal trainer, and after a while, I have to recertify myself as a certified trainer. Things change. Um, I have to get on top of what is happening. Uh, and so I think, you know, even with a lot of other professions, something like this, I think I wouldn't want to believe that somebody decide to just, you know, go on holiday for three years and then come back into the system. So that's probably a bad kind of example. Um, but I think for reasons like that is why we possibly should not take this out, is to have it stay um, so that persons can... Um, continue that continued education, even for other things, people have continued please? education. Can, um, so we're, I, on, the, I'm not we're sure. on the same point. We're, 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 we're in point. agreement. Okay. It, it's just that the <laughs> my understanding and I, the based on which I was speaking is to say that when so you've gone on your hiatus for three years, you're now at year three, one month, and you've put in your application to council. Part of the requirement would be that you would have, as happens with the, the, the um, legal profession, you have, to, you have to verify that you have taken your CLEs. You have done whatever examination, whatever courses to maintain your currency, your efficiency to teach. It just is that you are not teaching by, you know, by your own volition. So we're saying once you have met all those other prescriptions, including your continuing legal education, then the department shouldn't be here to say, oh, where were you for three years? All right, so we have uh, Member Hamilton followed by Member Morris with questions. And then after those two questions, we will move Thank on you, to the next presenter. So yeah, firstly, oh, you as well? okay. I will agree with the observation made at Clause 7M that speaks to the, the to conduct professional appraisals. I really do agree with that because going through the legislation myself, I, I had a question mark there as to why it is it was necessary for the council to carry out such an appraisal. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I agree with the proposal for the background checks to be applied to all teachers. I think, we, I don't think anybody can refute that proposal. Um, mention has been made in relation to the funding of the council. Where is the funds coming from? But if you look at the third schedule, it speaks to funds and resources of the council shall consist of such sums as may from time to time be placed at the disposal of the council by parliament, that's one. All monies paid to the council for the licensing of teachers and the grant of any authorization to teach. Interest profits from time to time accruing from investments and all other sums that may be payable or vested in the council. It means that the council will have some amount of flow of funding to it. My, my query, though, is in relation to Clause 45.4, where you said that for the renewal of the license, um, there are certain stipulations here. A license for an, un, an authorization to teach may be renewed only if the holder has practiced during the currency of the license continuously for at least three years or practice during the currency of the authorization to teach continuously for at least one school term or its equivalent in the month, calendar months. Now, you made reference to the fact that those two requirements are barriers for teachers with the renewal of the license. But um, if you look to clause 45.5, it says where the applicant does not meet the criteria specified in subsection 4A or B, 
the applicant simply needs to just apply for a license under Section 36 or Section 37. So if it is that the applicant is not current, all they have to do is just apply for a new license. So why is there an issue in relation to those provisions for renewal? Well, the, the, we believe the provision, the, the arguments made earlier, those were by member Cuthbert Flynn, were in respect of um, registration. So we find that we have the same requirement is there for registration as a license as for um, authorization to, to, to teach, which is a three-year currency. Well, not registration, because it'll be new. The three-year currency period, actively teaching period, period. And even though there, as you're, you're saying, um, there might be a way around that, what it really presents is another another avenue. So as you have stated, if persons don't meet this requirement, they haven't been actively engaged. Um, look at 40, 44B. It, I find it a bit problematic because 40, 40, um, the section B that you just read speaks to authorization to teach being in place for one month. I mean, one term, sorry. But then the same provision says that, well, you can go and apply on the authorization to teach, which is section 36. So it, it, it seems to be that it is directing it to the same provision you have just filled, because authorization to teach requires that you be, have taught for a term. If you haven't taught for a term, what do you do? You won't be able to get another authorization to teach anywhere else. That's just it because you have applied for an authorization to teach, but one of the requirements is where have you been, unless you're a new entrant, so we, we've excluded those, where you have to show that you have been actively engaged, and it says in Jamaica, by the way, so we don't, we're not even talking about the quality of talent we would lose from our expat community or foreign teachers or exchange students, that kind of thing. Where they, those persons, it's just saying that, well, it is going to look, what if you want to take persons out of retirement? Persons who want to, who are retired teachers, they want to don't come and be re-engaged in the system. The fact no, that well, well, that wouldn't apply for the renewals. That would be somebody coming into the system for the first time wanting to teach after they have retired for a period. But I'm re re referring now to the renewal aspect of it. But that would be a renewal, because you had a, while you were actively teaching before, to re prior to retirement, you were actively engaged. Then you have retired. Yeah, but we, all right, so, so what is the issue then if, if someone, for someone applying after they have been out of the classroom for three years as if they were applying for the first time? What really is the issue? I don't know, but legislation says they have to show that they have been actively engaged, they were actively teaching. So we don't exactly. know, which is what I've asked you, that we don't know, having read it, what was the evil, as you would say, Parliament was trying to fix. We believe, looking at other parts of kinds of jurisdiction, it is only to make sure that persons, as Member Cobra Finn has said, that you want to ensure that you're on top of your game. You know what is happening so that when you are away, for whatever reason, that you now looking to be re-engaged in the system, you can certify that you know what is happening. And we, we have said from the beginning that we believe that that has been addressed because part of the requirement, we believe, for registration or when you're applying for renewal is that you have to state, certify that you have complied with your continual professional development requirements, which are the courses you would have to take every year. So even though this person was not actively engage in teaching, they would have had to at some What What point would they be complying with their continuous studies? Because they, intend, because they understand that this is their profession that they have carved out, they have invested greatly in, and also they know There, there is no investment. I'm, no, the, the investment is at the original stage of going to school and qualifying. That's what I'm speaking of. So, I, I'm, I'm still having a difficulty understanding it. Maybe what I should do at the point where the technocrats can explain, um, Chair, um, why it is this is included, then maybe I can get further clarity. But as it is now, I'm, I'm really not understanding the argument. Thank you, Member. We'll move on to Member Morris and then um, 
Uh, Member Crawford. Oh, Member Brown. Okay, sorry, Member Brown. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Member Brown. I just have a short um, point of clarification. Uh, I remember that you mentioned, I think it was Section 30, Part 4, where you spoke about, you know, placing the burden on the principals instead of the teachers to indicate if they may have uh, picked up some criminal charges. And I wanted to ask, because in my mind, if the burden is placed on the teachers to report, there has to be so on the principals rather to report, there has to be some rubric or some guidelines that are followed. And I wanted to put it to you. I, I don't know if you mentioned it before, but unprofessional is mentioned as a key word there. And also, I think it was immoral. I'm not sure if that's the word. immoral, right, right, was mentioned. Uh, in your mind and through your recommendation, uh, is there any way you would see us framing that to provide some guidelines or some details if you're recommending that the principal should be the one to report um, any incident of that nature? Well, the definition as to what would constitute um, professional misconduct, things of that nature, we expect that those will be fully ventilated through the regulations and proper definitions would have to be put in place. We're just um, at this stage re um, recommending, recognizing that there would be a great problem in trying to get would-be offenders to self-report. And so that is why there's a recommendation to, to shift that responsibility. But as to what the ingredients are, the criteria are, that would be a matter for the committee when it comes together. Um, what we, the proposal is that the stakeholders will come together and put that definition as to what is, we're going back to fitness to teach as a profession, as a vis-a-vis -vis other professions. So that is something that would have to be explored in another setting, but we believe that there is adequate precedent for, um, to be relied on as to what, those what computes those kind of definitions. And, and remember, if I may, there are currently systems of reporting matters happening in schools. School boards are required to make reports. In fact, education officers who have responsibility to attend these board meetings have copies of reports that they take back to the Ministry of Education. So there is a system. Is it something we need to look at and strengthen? Yes, but I think there has to be a more structured approach and it cannot be left to the would-be offender to make the report. Um, that is not going to help. I agree with you. I just wanted to know if in your mind there was anything that you, you wanted to propose. I, I take it at when the regulation comes and you make the change for a broader consultation in developing the regulations, then we'll be able to contribute to that conversation. And I just want to make the point that a distinction must be made um, in between standards for teachers and standards for teacher educators. We must not miss that. We cannot have the same standards for persons who train the teachers for the teachers at the same time. So we have to All make right. a distinction. Thank you so Sorry. much. I have um, no I problem with, with holding standard member. We, okay. we are for that. Okay. But there must Mr. be reason. I wanted to come in with a clarification. Sorry, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, just to point out, since it has come up a few times now, Clause 63 of the bill imposes an obligation on employers to report certain things to the council. Um, and I, I think this provision might cover the gap that um, the present, presenters are concerned with. 63. This is page 51 of the, the written text. Clause 63, a person who employs a licensed teacher or an instructor shall immediately notify the council if a the person takes any action, including the dismissal of the licensed teacher or instructor on the ground specified in section 50, or B, the licensed teacher or instructor resigns or otherwise stops working for the person in circumstances in which the person, but for that fact, would have or might have dismissed the licensed teacher or instructor on ground specified in section 50. So the, the, the intention is to place, sorry, an obligation on the employer to 
um, inform the council um, in the circumstances which have been discussed. Thank you so much, Mr. Foreman. We'll take the last question from Member Crawford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, this bill is very dear to my heart as a graduate of Shorter Teachers College and the School of Education at UWI Mona. Uh, excellent presentation. I have a few concerns. Some have been echoed by my colleagues, so I won't repeat those. I just also want to place on record my support for your mention that we should include the criminal background checks at all levels and not just limit it to the early childhood education. I have a question on the point regarding the fines for the offenders. I noted where the bill says not exceeding 500,000, so it doesn't say 500,000, but what I'd like to hear from you, what in your mind would be a reasonable penalty for the offenders? Well, uh, our consideration on the matter is that if you have a well-structured system, which I hope we will have, if you know that Garth Anderson's license is going to come to an end, the system is being managed by the Ministry of Education. I, I cannot foresee how somebody would be out there practicing without one, because you are managing the system. In the American system, you go online, you quickly see that you get a note, a notification that your license will be up at X time. Right away, you paying the teachers. And even the private school, there is also a system to monitor that. So I don't see how. However, if it should happen, I think that the worst kind of punishment you can give a teacher is to withhold your salary. You're not paid. You can be struck from the register. You can be suspended. So many things. Why would we want to give the teacher a criminal record and that will follow the teacher forever. So we have to, and we don't even know if it's, if it's a first offense and you get a criminal record. So we are leaving, it seems, in the legislation room that if we slip, there is something else. We must set up proper structures. We are paying, we are running the system, we should know when there's, some, there's somebody whose license is going to be up. It shouldn't be left to chance that we're coming out to see if you have it. You should be able to go on your system and say, how many teachers have been registered? So it's the government who must remind teachers to renew their license and not the teachers themselves who must remember when to renew. I'm just trying to understand. I think, I think we are straying very far from what I'm saying. No, I'm That's just trying what to I'm understand. Saying. The system, as I understand it, will be managed by the government. If the government has a system... Clearly, the teachers have a responsibility. But you don't have to be going by chance to know if your teachers are registered. You should know. You should be taking action before it happens. In other words, you're being proactive. Somebody's license coming to an I end. Understand. That's how it happens in other developed countries who have similar systems. Okay, teachers I get, I can go to Florida. You get an alert, you're out. You cannot turn up to school because your license is up. All right. That's it. So okay. uh, if we are going in that direction, we should go for best practices. We must not set up a trap like a policeman hiding on the roadside hoping that you're going to break the law and come out with a gun to take your speed limit. So, um, set Mr. the system Gar Anderson, so that it works. Mr. Anderson, after all of the alerts that you give to a teacher and the teacher still does not... In, well, the teacher the minister will not be in the classroom. You don't have a license. You're not in. All right. Thank Out. you. Uh, member, member Brown? Member, um,
them come for it. You're saying if somebody have a master's, that should qualify them in education and a first degree, that should qualify them. I don't understand the clause now to be saying that. And so you're saying broaden this clause so it can include more persons who are capable and qualified. Is that your position? Yes, but not in the same way you're, you're phrasing it. We didn't want to single out persons necessarily who have higher than what is prescribed. So the benchmark now is a bachelor's degree or a bachelor's degree with um, a diploma in education. So it is, I guess it can be appreciated that if you have in, um, qualifications that um, supersede those, then you could get qualified. Our concern where we see a gap is in the group that would not have be able to obtain a, the level of qualification equivalent to a bachelor's degree, but they're otherwise competent and trained and qualified. For instance, I'm here and mentioned GC Foster College. So, uh, uh, and I mentioned in my presentation, early childhood education practitioners who, pres uh, depending on Edna Manley. So what we find, and again, this was clearly um, stated in, uh, the Patterson Report, where it singled out that historically, there's based on how our education system has been structured, and one of the successes of the system is that we recognize that there is a need for balance in, in the education system in terms of our educators, not only those who have attained to the level of a tertiary education, as in a bachelor's degree, but also those who are vocationally trained in a specialized area. So what we, the words that we have suggested that should be incorporated should really address the lack of um, attention to vocationally trained persons. In other words, we don't agree that this definition capture who a teacher should be. That's where I'm going to Make it wider. Approximately 30,000 teachers. At the moment, it may not be, but I understand that if it's, it's a desirable that we should aim for, and so I can't fix the other part of the system. You are in a better position, member, to do so. But if we are looking carefully at what is happening in our institutions of learning, I think it is something desirable, and we should aim for that. How you do it and uh, the, the mechanics of that, we don't have the answers here because, as you can understand, we are teachers. We are on the barracks. We don't operate in the great house. that I don't agree with. Yeah, so teachers don't pay a fee now. You don't know how much a fee will be in the new law. You don't know if it's going to be subject to affirmative resolution by both houses of parliament, for example. So I, am I correct that you have a fear that these fees now may eventually turn out like the the government may approach it like what they're approaching the motor vehicle concession. 
That no. is to say, the. I, I am to say. Sorry, member, no. member, no. member, no. please withdraw no. that. No. Member Brown, member Brown, no, no. please withdraw you can that talk comment. To them, but I am, please I am entitled to raise comment. questions. <laughs> member I am entitled Brown, to raise questions, madam. Member Brown, please withdraw that comment. No, no, no. I withdraw, withdraw yeah. the fact yeah. that the government has said please. they want to make a change in the motor vehicle. Concession. Somebody needs to turn on this mic. Oh, oh, the chairman asked for you to withdraw that, that statement. To and I'm that trying to see what you, what you want me to do. what we're doing here. I want to see what you want me to withdraw. Okay. And I'm and one, sec one second, member. One second. I'm explaining. Right, but you don't have to bring that in right here. No, you right mean now. I don't you have to, but I choose to. Because I choose to bring it in because it's about trust. And you're asking the teachers to trust us as government, that we'll put fees there that are not going to be exorbitant, are not going to be hurtful of their interests. And I'm trying to get a member gauge. Brown, I'm trying Brown, to get a gauge of how they feel about it. Member, the government has no reason to, to come in with, with fees that are onerous to the teacher. You I heard, don't know what the fees you are. The member, you heard Member Hamilton read to you the different sources of funding that this institution will have. So, Ch Chairman, there's no requirement for me to accept what anybody else say now. I have an independent view. I have an independent view, and I'm canvassing it, because in the end, I have to vote. I have to consent to the legislation as a parliamentarian. So I ask again, is it the fear that the fees may be exorbitant? Uh, member, the, the fear out here is that what teachers need or the concern, there should be a clear formula, some indication how this will be done. It is left open and it is um, seen by many uh, that it is that way because, you know, it gives the government leverage to, to levy um, from time to time what those fees are going to be. And uh, if I understand it, in other um, professions, you have an idea, certainly, how the fees, I, I understand it will go up by 5% or you go up by whatever percentage. Um, if, if we think, and I'm going to put it this way, if we are seeing how um, important teaching is, um, we ought to be, in my mind, be focused on how we treat with investment in teachers, mentoring, and and, and professional development, let's not get caught up. And I think that should be easy to fix about fees for teachers and for teachers to pay fees. Teachers are pushing back. This is one of the reasons that they are going to be called upon to fund this entire massive operation. And let, let me just go further. You, I, I see pointing to the legislation. There are uh, issues and other is, um, you know, elements within the education system that funds should be provided. I don't know that, well, from where we sit, government have all the funds to consistently support this kind of operation. I'm just being reasonable in my thinking from where I sit. So it's a reasonable question for teachers to ask, where, what's the mechanism? How will this pan out? So we have a roadmap where we're going and we don't get something, a kind of Nicodemus kind of approach to how fees are charged. And I ask you to withdraw Nicodemus you now. Let me ask you this. Would you, would you support a cap on the fees as a percentage or a fraction of a percentage? I, I'm not getting that to the specific number of, say, salary of teachers. Well, though, that's certainly an avenue that can be explored. Thank you. And you're not, as I understand it, saying that don't charge us a fee. Charge us the independent school and the private sector. You're not really proposing that. You're just saying yeah, that's an alternative you're saying. That's an but, alternative. But not that, that's the way to go. Absolutely. That's why I understood you. Let me get to the next question now. That's good. That's why the, that's why the law required the English thing to be in there. Yeah. yeah the, it's all right. But we understand that. Anyway, you're on the mirror here. we talk about that afterwards. 
dismissal, section 34B requires that the employer make a report. Are you of the view that that report should be shared with the teacher? In other words, the teacher is terminated, but a report is sent to the teacher's council, but the teacher doesn't know what is sent there that could block him or her for the rest of their life. Should that report also be shared with the teacher? That goes to the teacher council. I see no difficulty with that because ultimately it's the council that will make the final decision. And so, natural justice in your view would require that the teacher be provided with the information so that a decision maker as the council would be could, he would know what they're going to decide on. Your answer to that is yes. No, you need to. Yes, yes, remember, I, I, I answered you. I'm, I don't, there's nothing against leading here. I want answers so that it can help me in deciding how I consent and advice on the bill. So I'm asking these questions. You raised the issue of the power of the council and the independence of the council. Is the teacher's college of the view that, as proposed now, that independence is of the councils undermined? Correct, because it's, it's not comparable to similar bodies that exist and we highlighted, for example, the power of the minister um, in the legislation as proposed that if we are talking about independence uh, in terms of it, for example, the, the CARICOM framework um, speaks clearly to, clearly to that, that it should be independent of any kind of interference. And how it is crafted now um, can, in fact, lend itself to some level of interference, primarily around the powers of the minister, and that the board it shall, shall carry out um, directives given. And that is certainly of concern. Your knowledge of the CARICOM thing comes from you being President of the Caribbean Union of Teachers? Correct, sir. Good. And therefore, you said to us earlier that we are the first of CARICOM having reached this far. Correct, member. And do you believe that in terms of the council composition, there should be less power to the minister to appoint as many persons as the minister now is allowed to appoint to this. Well, precisely, I think we made that point that um, the, the power of the minister in the legislation should be looked at carefully. The council, in fact, the CARICOM document says that 60% approximately, that's a proposal of the council should be licensed teachers so that the majority of teachers, and we indicated, for example, that the CEO should be an ex officio member, but um, we, we, our members even went further. At least some of them had the view that those who are non-teachers should be ex officio members of the board. They should not make any professional judgment on, on teachers when they are not part of the profession. So non-teachers should be ex officio members. They are there to advise and to give all the requisite support, but when it comes down to voting, that's not how it, they shouldn't be able to vote because that is not how other um, similar bodies operate. And that 60% of the composition would be contrast with 100% at the General Legal Council and are pretty close to 100% at the General Legal Council. And similarly, in the nursing and the medical profession, and those professions that You are, are very much are correct, Member. That is precisely where we are coming from. I, I want to thank you and your presenters for sharing with us your views, because certainly for me, 
I want to come to this decision on this bill, having had the basis and the background of those who produce the teachers and have done a relatively excellent job thus far. Final question. You mentioned educator, teachers educator versus teachers. Could you expound on that a little bit for me, please? Well, the, the, the practice of a teacher in a primary or high school is totally different from those who are actually training the teachers. You are operating at a totally different level. And so standards for the teacher educator would have to be different from the teacher in um, a primary school or an early childhood school or a high school because you're operating um, totally different. You're, the expectations are totally different because you are, you are, we are uh, given the responsibility to make the teacher, to create the teacher. Totally different from someone who is going to execute now and teach in a, in a um, classroom setting. I, I did say finally, do you think teacher educator should therefore become part of the definition, should be inserted in the, the bill? Absolutely, and that is why we have been emphasizing the point. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Member Brown. Thank you for the questions. Um, at this point, I've given the time 4.37. Um, I would like to thank the Teachers College, Teachers College of Jamaica for your very extensive presentation. Uh, there were way more questions than anticipated. And yes, Member Brown, you were more time conscious than I was. Um, I want to um, just ask, well, okay, maybe. <laughs> for the other two presenters, um, just given the time of day, um, if you don't mind, we would like to invite you back next week. Maybe we just invite one at a time, given the experience here this afternoon, so that you will have adequate time in order to do your presentation. I'm sorry? The, the present, some of the presentations are short, Chair. They're short? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Madam Minister, I am guided. we have no objection to come back next week. However, we need to know what time. And before I even stepped into this room, I was told that we only have 20 minutes. So is that true or not? It, it is true, it is true. Um, however, I allowed uh, the presentation because it seems they, they, uh, you know, they came with an extensive presentation looking at uh, all the clauses, apparently. Um, if when you come the next time, you do need more than 20 minutes, uh, you will be allowed more than 20 minutes. <laughs> so what time, what time are you expecting us, madam? Um, we are expecting the, the next meeting date is set for Thursday, April 21, 2022 at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Right, and then we would ask the School of Education uh, to come the next week, School of Education. So who will be first, madam? We will or we'll take, be first. Yeah, we'll take, yes. Yes. Thank you very much. We have enjoyed listening to all the comments made by our previous um, delegation. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. At this time, you're free to go. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Teachers College of Jamaica. So, uh, any other business? Okay, so members, there is no other business this afternoon. And so we're going to adjourn until next week, Thursday, April 21 at 2 p.m. So move, Chair. Yes, all right. Seconded.
join us live this Wednesday, April 13 at 8 p.m. for the official launch of Jamaica.